Welcome my friends, this is Maniacal Incorporated and this is the start of a new series looking at Ireland and Irish history in Total War Thrones of Britannia. This game was developed by Creative Assemblies and published by Sonic the Hedgehog in 2018 and it came out during a period of tremendous interest in the Viking era. The Vikings TV show ran from 2013 to 2020 but this was released to rather lackluster reviews, poor sales, and was eventually pretty much abandoned. There were big plans to release more and more factions, but other than a single DLC, none of those plans came to fruition. There's a lot of different reasons for this. As far as I know, on release there were a couple of gameplay issues and bugs, most of which have been sorted out by patches. Now some of those have started to come back again, with attempts to update the game for Windows 10 and 11. I've had a couple of crashes already and I'm running this with decreased graphics and in a Windows 8 compatibility mode in an attempt to stave off any further crashes. But the big issues were that people described it as little more than a mod for Total War Attila. It uses the Attila engine and is effectively just a reskin but with a lot less troop diversity and regional diversity. We'll be playing as Meath, and we're basically going to have spearmen, either on foot or on horse, poking people with spears or throwing spears. And we're going to be fighting in the rain on grassy hills. Once we have fought one battle, we have fought all of them. Now, if you are new to this channel, welcome in. What I tend to do is I tend to focus on... Ireland and the representation of Ireland in grand strategy games, or just in games in general. Uh, to date, it has been pretty much all Paradox games, so Crusader Kings 3 and Vicky 3 in particular. And today, I'm going to be playing as the Kingdom of Meath, and I'm going to give a historical overview of who we are and what's going on on the island of Ireland at this point in time. If you're not interested in that, there's going to be... Uh, Timestamps below and there'll be chapters, you can skip forward to the actual gameplay. I'm going to keep everything on normal, I'm going to keep the difficulty settings on normal. Now, for a quick historical overview of the time period, it is the year 878. And there are two entities that we need to take a look at to explain what's going on as far as our Meath playthrough is concerned. We have, up here in the north, we have Aloch, and this is the Kingdom of the Northern Enail. So the King of Aloch is the King of the Northern Enail. Down here we have Meath, and this is the lands of the Southern Enail. So the King of Meath is the King of the Southern Enail. And over this, the King of all of the Enail is the King of Tara. The Enail, both branches, the Northern and Southern, claim descent from various sons and grandsons of Nile of the Nine Hostages, Nuil Nanoi Gulach. Now in 862, Moel Shocknail Mac Moel Rooney, the King of Meath, so the King of the Southern Enail, and King of Tara, died. None of his sons were old enough to succeed him as King of Meath, so the title went to a, a relative. Miners could not inherit in Ireland, and regencies did not exist. I have played this uh, small bit of this game uh, just to get back into it, and I've played so poorly that I've managed to get Flanchina killed, and if you do that, a regency begins. This was not... This is ahistorical and was not an actual thing under uh, Brehen law of this time period. So in 862, when Moel Shocknail died, a close relative became the new King of Meath, and the title King of Tara rotated to the King of Aloch, A. Finlia. In 877, so just over a year ago, the man that we're looking at here, Flanchina, one of Moel Shocknail's sons, murdered his way to power in Meath. He murdered the ruling king and became the new king of Meath. In November of 879, Aethin Leah, the king of Alloc, is going to die, and the title, King of Tara, is going to rotate back down to Flanchina, to the king of the southern Enail. So this is how the, the title, King of Tara, operates. It rotates between the two dynasties. Now, Flanchina is an interesting character for two reasons, for two things that he attempts to do. The first thing he attempts to do is he attempts to conflate the position King of Tara with the High Kingship of Ireland. This is a largely mythological title, 
that had been held by the likes of Nile of the Nine Hostages and Khan of the Hundred Battles, but Flan Shinna argues that the King of Tara and the High King of Ireland are one and the same, so he's now basically arguing that he is the High King of Ireland. And the next thing he attempts to do is he attempts to prevent the rotation of the title King of Tara back to the northern Enail. So on his death, it's expected to rotate north to Nile Glundov, who is the current King of Alloc. And pretty much all of Flan's career is aimed at preventing that from happening. In the early 900s, one of his sons, Muel Shocknell, will be killed and Muel Shocknell was described as the heir designate of Ireland. So this was Flanshina's attempt to basically create what could have been a centralised nationwide rule. This is what Flanshina is aiming at, is centralising power in himself and his family. And it could have led to a united, centralised rule in Ireland. Uh, this won't be attempted again until Brian Baru. Uh, just over a hundred years' time. And Niall Glundov fights a number of wars against Flanchina to prevent Flanchina from monopolising the title, uh, to guarantee that the title will rotate back northwards, and indeed, when Flanchina dies in 916, Niall Glundov will become the new King of Tara, effectively High King of Ireland, or he will be referred to in later chronicles as the High King of Ireland. So in a few moments now we're going to have a cutscene with some rather questionable voice acting in which we're told that our father was the High King of Ireland. So that's a reference to Muel Shocknail MacMuel Rooney, who Flanchina kind of retroactively proclaimed as High King of Ireland. He was addressed in the Chronicles as Ri Ola Aaron, the King of All Ireland, and is pretty much the greatest king until Brian Baru. But we're also going to see that they claim that the arrival of the Vikings presents opportunities for Flan to use them to seize control of the entire island. So Flan came to power in Meath in 877. The period from 876 until the year of Flan's death in 916 is referred to as the 40 years rest. This is a period of waning Viking power on the island. The Vikings are pretty much they're concerned with something else that's going on out foreign up in this region, as far as I know. So they've left. The most uh, powerful fighters have left to make their name way out foreign. And what's left behind is pretty much uh, bullied by local Irish rulers. There's going to be a series of uh, battles in Dublin for the succession. So Dublin is heavily weakened. But there's our kind of historical overview as to where we are. Potentially a man who could have united Ireland not alone under his own individual rule, but under that of his family, unfortunately internal upheaval within the wider Enail, and rebellions from his own son, Dhanakadhan, uh, would largely prevent that from happening. So, let's actually take a look at what we can do as Meath. We have legitimacy, which is the unique trait that belongs to all of the Gaelic kingdoms, all two of them, there you go, that's, uh, that's an interesting... Our bravery is legendary. Ah, that's an interesting accent. So we have legitimacy. Silence those who question your divine right to rule. Divine right to rule did not exist in Ireland. This is... This makes no sense. However, it is worded differently in the game. So I won't focus too much on it, but basically might is right. So there was never anyone who claimed a divine right to rule as High King of Ireland. We have better bonuses when raiding, which is very applicable to the time period, and a 25% income from church buildings. Our faction features, we can hold the Fair of Taltu, the Eanach Talton. So it's a unique version of decrees, which gives us basically uh, local stability. This is actually something I'm going to be talking about in relation to Crusader Kings 3, the Tours and Tournaments uh, expansion shortly. Uh, we can build high crosses. So these are unique building chains that improve fame and diplomatic standing with all factions. Uh, Flanchina famously commissioned the Cross of the Scriptures at Clonmacnoise. And then we have excellent mid-to-tier sword infantry, including unique Gallo Gloss Gaul Oglig infantry. In the late 9th century, 
So the Gold Oak League appeared in Ireland around the 1200s. And we have exceptional javelin infantry, or infantry, I should say. Uh, victory objectives. Like I said earlier on, once you fought one battle in this game, you fought all of them. So I could spend hours and hours and hours conquering the British Isles. I'm going to go for the short fame victory. Achieve 256 fame. And we need to conquer areas that control five buildings. So the Cathedral of St. Chiron, which is in Clonmacnoise, which we control. We have to go down into Munster to take Cashel. Up into Armagh uh, to take the Monastery of St. Patrick. Down to Ross Carberry, oh God help us. Down to, way down into Cork to take a monastic school and up into Donegal to take the Grianon of Alloch. There are a couple of other shorter victories. I do like the fact that the short victories don't require you to leave Ireland. Uh, some of the longer victories do require you to, uh, to take control of regions. Um, actually, the Long Kingdom victory doesn't require us to leave Ireland. Ireland either, which is fantastic. It doesn't actually kind of uh, give in to that kind of British Isles mentality, but the... Uh, where is the other one? Um, the long fame victory would require us to actually take some some areas in Britain. Anyway, we'll ignore that. So we're going for the short fame victory. That's going to be... that's going to keep me happy. And we will start our campaign, like I said, leaving everything on normal. Your father, as our king, dreamed of a united Ireland. But his vision was never realized. Now your brethren in the north hold the high kingship, and you must wait your turn. But the arrival of the Viking foreigners brings opportunity. Their strength could be yoked to your cause. With them by your side, you can fulfill your father's dream whilst claiming the high kingship for your line. One throne will rule Ireland. It is your destiny to be king. You must meet many oh, go away from me, woman. Go away from me. The title of high king. Get out of it. I'm not near listening to an English woman. Go away. We should stabilize internally before we look beyond our borders. Prove your right to rule and eliminate the nearby rebels. So we're going to start with a bit of a rebel army that we have to deal with. It's entirely possible that's actually all I'll get done in this episode. There's a lot of history. There is a lot, there is a lot of history to go through. You can already see our ma. You can see some interesting locations over here. What I might do is at the start of every episode, I might just do a bit of a focus a historical focus so focus on one entity i was going to do a big tour of ireland but i might just focus on like region by region at the start of each episode if that's something you'd be interested in comment below or if you couldn't care less please do comment as well as we've started over here i will just take a tour of our land so this is the kingdom of Meath, and over here we have the kingdom of Meath, and over here we have the kingdom of Meath. this is all Meath. Uh, here it's been broken out into Bray or Brea, which was the eastern part of the Kingdom of Meath, the holdings of the Sheilin Edo Sloinia, and most likely they would have actually ruled as far as here. And this region then is Clan Colman, which is the dynasty that we're part of. Uh, Linz was under Viking control, but the Vikings wouldn't maybe have had a region this big. Uh, they did chip out a part of Leinster and Meath to... Um, to form Dublin. And just very quickly, as we're here, we have Newgrange, a tourist attraction that was uh, built in the 1960s. Board Forte put up all this nonsense that, oh, Newgrange is as old as the pyramids. We built that in the 1960s. And just created all this advertising to convince people that it's, it's ancient. It's not. It's like 60 years old. Down here we have the Hill of Tara with... The Leofold, the Stone of Destiny. So, of course, like these two areas should be and are in Meath. And here is Noth. Here is Noth. Here is Noth. So that's a another kind of passage tomb at Noth. Something like Newgrange. And I should actually start up here. We have Arda. 
a different Arda to where the Arda chalice was found that was in Limerick. We have Cianinus, which is Kells, where the Book of Kells was finished, and we have Clonard. And over here we have our capital of Clonmacnoise. The burial site, Flanchina, will be buried here. The southern Enail kings are buried here. And we have a variety of different buildings and building chains. So here's the monastery of St. Chiron. And if I right click on it, we can get some info on it. And it goes all the way up to a level 5, which we're going to have to reach. It's one of the requirements for the short fame victory. Uh, here's our money. I'm not going to go too much in depth into explaining all of the, the various different things. But here's our food. This is going to be important because each military unit that we recruit will require 10 food. So we are going to have to shove up our food production. And that can be done by looking, we'll say, first of all, at Arda. And we have a pasture in... Where's this? In Kells, we have a level 2. So we started with a pasture and we upgraded it to cattle grazing. So we're going down that chain now, and we could create a cattle herd for three supplies, uh, increased food production. So if we look again at our pasture, this will give us 95 farm income, 48 food production. This will give us decreased food production, but increased gold income. I'm going to go for the increased food production, so it's going to be pretty much the same as what we have in... Uh, Kells. Uh, we have the ability to upgrade the silver veins. Both of those will lead to public order deficits, so I'll leave them alone for now. Like I said, I won't get too much into the history here. We have the Kayla Day, which was a secular ascetic order. The game, however, basically has the Kayla Day as just Celtic Christianity. And just to kind of look at some of the, the nonsense that you get, uh, if we take a look at the, the last sentence, several aspects of the Celts' tribal outlook were reflected in their newly emerging religious practices with an understanding of faith that celebrated grace, yeah, that's true, and nature, eh, as gifts from God, with strong traditions of poetry, mysticism, and inclusion of women in its leadership. That is total nonsense. Inclusion of women... That didn't descend from the Druids, we'll say, and it did not happen at this time period. There is one exception, and that is the, uh, the Monastery of St. Bridget, where there, which was ruled by an abbess, or headed by an abbess. That is one minor exception. But extrapolating out that Celtic Christianity included women in its leadership because of that is nonsense. So you do see a lot of kind of poorly researched memes, effectively, when it comes to Ireland in the game. Uh, so the Kayla Day, yeah, they're kind of, it's kind of a weird, it's a weird one to have here. Uh, I will, I'll go for the Priory store, because we have a level 2 Kayla Day Priory here, so I'm going to go for the Priory store, which will give us additional income and commerce income, and it gives us extra church income. So we have 2,620 remaining. The, uh, the upgrade here is hefty, and one of the things that it does is it knocks down food production. It actually uh, decreases our food production dramatically. We do need this, however, to unlock this building and to begin the process of getting towards that, uh, that victory. So do you know what? Yeah, sure. So we start off in a rather peculiar position. Uh, here is the rebel army. Commanded by Cronin, and here is the man himself, Flan Shida. So we should be able to take a look at him. Uh, here's his command ability, his governance ability, and his zeal, which helps with public order and helps with a couple of uh, upgrades in battle. Here is his wife. And he is heroic, so this is a trait that's kind of currently in play. And then we have his personality. All of this actually seems to be in play. Uh, but when this group is active, as it is at the moment, we get extra benefits from it. And we can get followers over time, which will do various things for him. I'm going to move him into Kells. Because as you can see, here is our attempts to recruit. And we can't. So I'm going to move into Kells. 
And now we do have the ability to recruit units. So there is basically a global pool of units that you recruit from. And our available troops, we have swordsmen, we have spearmen, we have axemen, we have dags. And I'm pretty much going to be focusing on... We'll get skirmisher cavalry. We'll get some horse boys. And we will go for... I think we're just going to go for some... Would I be able to get uh, freemen spearmen? And would I be able to get kerns as well? That's looking a bit pricey. 720. And it's going to cost 30 food. Yeah. So we've recruited them. But at the moment... They're not fully upgraded, so they don't appear fully upgraded. They are not um, reinforced. They reinforce slowly over time. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically end the turn and allow these forces either to siege this area to begin um, raiding. So to raid, you just basically plonk yourself down on a trade route. Which isn't really how raiding would have been conducted in this time. I thought we would have actually gone in and raided settlements. But uh, yeah, you can just plonk yourself down on a trade route and raid the trade. I won't go too much in depth into everything that's up here. Here are our decrees. So there is the Fair of Taltu, the Enoch Taltan, also known as the Taltan Games. And we have our objectives, we have our economy, so we can see basically our income and outcome. I know a lot of people will drive up the tax rate, but I'm, I'm happy enough with the way things are at the moment. Trade just kind of happens automatically. Uh, technology is an interesting one. So to unlock melee unit research, we need to recruit five sword or axe infantry. Here for spearmen and for missiles. So depending on what units you actually recruit, it's going to determine what uh, direction your research goes in. Most likely the first one that will open up is this one when St. Chiron's Monastery is upgraded. And we have Diplomacy, where we can go and talk to all the people. And last but not least, uh, the Family Tree. Here is our sister, Moel Favol, and her husband, Krul, who is the ruler of Osri. And here is our son, Donikadan. Uh, so if Flan was to die, a regency would be put in place for Donikadan, whereas in reality... A different branch of the family would have inherited. Right, that's pretty much as much as we can do for our first turn. Let us end the spring of 878. So a new season begins. We are into the summer. If you are new to this channel, God help you. You're beginning to discover just how much time I spend uh, talking about Irish history. Here is Ehrman. He is the governor of Clan McNoise, and he has become a mediator. Mediator? I hardly know her. Uh, impartial adjudication is essential, and he has gotten this because we have high public order. So that's actually in the, uh, uh, in the region itself. So depending on the state of our kingdom, the various different characters can get different upgrades. And we actually have another general down here as well. Now, as you can see, we're on 20 food, so I'm not going to recruit anyone else at the moment. But here is Alil with a single spearman. What I might actually do is begin the the task of bringing him up towards Arda, so we should have some more money uh, by the time we get him up there, because most likely one of our first major pushes is going to be for Armagh. So we're going to be... Uh, pushing up through. Hmm, could we just... Could we just go straight for them? We wouldn't actually have any uh, roads to them. So I was going to go through uh, Kilmore And up in this direction. We'll see, we'll see. I think the most important thing for now... We will not fail you. Is, and we're also going to have a war with Brefni and Dublin now in a... Uh, quite shortly as well. We could recruit some more forces, but you know what we as might as well take what we have and go out against this lad. So some of our forces have replenished. And we will manually fight this battle. I'll probably manually fight most of the battles, but I mightn't show them all. 
especially the, the kind of the shorter ones where we're just hunting down a unit of 15 troops. The, the horse boys create a very interesting style of combat because they basically ride in, throw spears right out. They can be very difficult to engage by anything that isn't uh, ranged, so it can be a bit of havoc trying to to isolate them and fight them. Which is why I recruited more horse boys, because they're devils. But basically we're going to see that in combat there's going to be a lot of just standing there and horse and javelins across at the other lads. So we have our weather conditions. It's dry. And we're... Uh, where are we fighting? Is this the northeast of Scotland? Is this Wales? Is this just outside London? It could be anywhere. Basically all the battlefields are going to look like this. We will start our deployment. And what I tend to do, out of force of habit, is uh, put everyone in groups. I think what we'll try and do is move move up this way and try and kind of avoid the, uh, the trees. It can make the combat a bit awkward. Uh, there are our spearmen. There are our actual full swordsmen. I thought I turned the voices off. Because I hate them. No, I didn't. By all accounts, I'm going to have to turn that. I'm going to have to turn that off again. I leave them on just to show you how bad they are for this one battle. The Irish will say things like uh, "Sons of the Morrigan," which they would not have said at this point in time. They will also say things like "True Britons," which I think was purposely put in this game to give me a heart attack. Sons of the Morrigan, you're not a son of the Morrigan. Shut up. You goddamn idiot. And now we begin... Shut up, you. Now we begin the slow... The slow march forward. So the goal here is going to be to have our... Horse cavalry, or our horse boys, engage there. That's actually their household raiders. I would rather to get them against the horse cavalry. I'm trying to keep these guys in reserve just in case they're needed, but they are a bit... Um, they are a bit weak. So these are our forces, some that we're just kind of recruiting at the moment. And they were thinking about coming in against us. They've decided against it. Very wise. There's their javelin skirmishers. We don't want to be caught in a position where our... Um, our swordsmen are unable to kind of respond to... If uh, somebody charges our units down here. Okay. True Britons forever, one of them, one of them just said. I'm going to burn this game. I'm going to set fire to this game. Sonic, you have insulted me for the last time. So this is... Yeah, this is pretty much combat in this game. We are the Gales. We're all Gale from Coronation Street. I... Whoever said True Britons Forever, you're the first. You're the first to be sent in to die. The uh, the other thing that I really enjoy is who's up for a Barney, which just sounds so idiotic. I wonder are the other regions just as weird sounding. Now we have. Do we have some movement? Nope. Never mind. So if we can do nothing else, we're gonna bring our. Horsemen. Now, what's going to happen is the horsemen are going to get into range, and then they're going to fall out of range almost immediately. It it, it gets weird. Uh, they are bringing forward. Are they bringing forward? I thought they were bringing forward their javelers. They're not. Uh, we might be able to get some missiles into the back of these guys, hopefully. So you'll see now that our horsemen are falling back, but they don't actually kind of... Um, they don't keep... They'll just run away. And keep their backs to... 
they're not going to constantly keep fighting. So they'll fall back, but they don't then come forward again to, uh, to actually try and do anything. Which can be a bit annoying. So we're seeing the uh, the actual ruler coming in in this region. So here's our other swordsmen. Do you know what? We'll send in our reinforcements. So we have our skirmishers, uh, who I will send in against the spearmen. All of our spearmen are going in against their household the cavalry. We haven't taken huge casualties on the um, on Flanchina's forces. Our horse boys have taken a bit of a bit of a beating. So you see, the forces just fall back and keep falling back, which can be very, very infuriating. And we're not basically going to be able to hunt these guys down. They're gonna, they're gonna just outrun us. Who's for a Barney? Oh dear God! I actually cannot tolerate these voices, these voice lines anymore. Where's Aganta? Oh god, where's Aganta? So help me god. I thought I turned this off. So they have broken our... Uh, Flanchina has stopped charging. And there we go, a uh, victory. These guys again, like I said, they've just they've just turned their backs, which is quite problematic. So once you order them to attack, they don't kind of keep attacking. Uh, they will eventually just stop and put themselves in a very very bad position. Uh, we'll see if Flan can get his forces over and actually attack, uh, wipe this group, just get some experience. But yet, yeah, we're now into that very common stage at the end of Total War Games, where you're just basically mopping up the battlefield. And there we go. So, 49 losses. Again, I'm playing on normal difficulty, which isn't... It's probably... I won't say it's a bit too easy. Like I've said, I have messed up in the past and gotten Flan killed, so I'm by no means an expert. And of course, we have not done enough damage to actually eliminate the enemy forces completely, so we're going to have to follow them into Bray. Uh, we do have the ability to increase our unit uh, units replenished by basically gang pressing. The 29 units we've captured, we're good for gold. And we don't need to kill them. Uh, killing every last survivor may satisfy a thirst for blood, but your enemy and their allies will take grave exception to this. But the enemy of your enemy will like you the more for it, so it's kind of a diplomatic option. Uh, we will go with the gang pressing of the forces. So Hronen has been killed. We've gotten some upgrades. Uh, here we have this concept of legitimacy. Which is the unique kind of modifier, would we call it that, for the Gaelic tribes. For Kirken and for Mead. And we get things for it. Basically by conquering settlements, by I think forming alliances. And by raiding settlements. And raids. Raids also help to give us legitimacy. So our legitimacy is kind of low at the moment. And we can start working on increasing that. And we have a number of different options. 
we could follow them in and upset St. Patrick's champions. Uh, we would end up uh, upsetting Bree, we'll say. Yeah, do you know what? We'll I'll follow him in. So we actually had an ability there, and I should have I should have checked with that. First of all, I don't think I can do it now. Do you know what? It's it's fine. I'm gonna manually fight the battle, but I'll probably I'll probably just uh, handle it off screen. I forgot to upgrade Flanchina, so he now has some uh, promotions that he can get. Basically, he can assign. Uh, a follower who's going to give him some upgrades. Trying to kill these devils is like trying to eat mercury with a fork. It's very hard to pick up and you're like, wait, why am I eating mercury with a fork? Why am I eating mercury? Decisive victory. Units replenished. Now, because we're in neighboring territory, they are rather upset with us. So I think we're getting, um, and we're not actually in a position to get back into our own territory. And because we're in enemy territory, we've also stopped replenishing. We're being told that some skills are available. So Flan Shinna can receive a follower. And we're going to work predominantly on his command ability. So the champion will give him plus one command. And command is used for... Increasing the rally ability, uh, bodyguard size, and unit morale when the general is alive. Scribes will increase income in the local area, so good for um, local governors. Uh, bards will increase zeal, and zeal can also help in battle and public uh, order, so in battle and in uh, governance. Uh, foragers will increase food. Pillagers will increase the amount of money we get from raiding if we go raiding. Uh, quartermasters are actually handy as well for the campaign movement range. Uh, priests will help us with diplomacy, pretty much. And siege engineers, I'm not too sure what they do. So, champion and accept. Right then, with all that done, we will bring the summer of 878 to an end. So this is a common event which pops up at this point in time. The Coastal Conflict. So Dublin has basically attacked Bray. And we have two options. We can attack Bray or we can intervene and attack Dublin. And I think that's the option that we will take. We should try and stop Dublin from conquering Bray. But are we strong enough? Dublin has powerful friends and other Vikings in Ireland will surely not stand idly by. If we strike them, we will intervene and attack Dublin. So they've now declared war on us. And our governor in Clonmacnoise has become demanding because of the Tide Hall. So he's gotten plus one governance, but public order has decreased. Now, I've had to move my forces, and I haven't really wanted to do that. I've had to move them out to start replenishing, because we could do with getting some extra forces. I would like to have kept them there, so that if Dublin moved up, we could actually have joined in on that battle. But uh, we do need to, uh, to replenish some forces, and of course, I think Dublin will probably... I don't see them, but they'll probably come forward with an army roughly the same size as what uh, Bray has. I'm going to continue marching Alil to Arda and get ready to begin recruiting some extra forces for him. And as we're sitting on a chunk of extra money at the moment and we're going to be getting a big deficit from uh, St. Chiron's community when it's built, I'm going to begin building a cattle herd to further increase food production. And just for the fun of it, I'm going to move Flanchina all of two feet to the south. Uh, to get him on this road, so as far as I know, we're now raiding it, and we'll see some bonuses, hopefully, in the next turn from raids, and possibly even from legitimacy. Uh, the other thing that I've done is I've slightly, well, I've recruited a unit for Alil, a spearman, just to uh, start moving us closer to getting that research done. So we're going to park ourselves here, we're going to try and uh, recover some units, and if Dublin does come north and hits uh, north, 
Well, hopefully they will suffer enough damage that we'll be able to go in and deal with them. We will end the autumn of 878. So Dublin's forces have moved south into Leinster by the looks of it. There's Glendalough. Literally the Glen of Two Lakes, anglicised as Glendalough. So that's an interesting, an interesting development from them. That means that Loch Gower, Goat Lake, or the Lake of Goats, is undefended. But they do have a substantial army that they could march up at any time. I'm wondering what, um, what happened here that brought them to war with Leinster. Now, I actually forgot to put the raiding stance on in the last turn, so we're not actually doing anything at the moment. But you know what we can do? Because our legitimacy is is uh, falling a bit. We're going to take our forces, and we are going to... Do we want to march on Loch Gower? That is a substantial Viking army, if they bring that up. I think we will actually put ourselves to raiding. We'll stay where we are, and we will raid for a while. With Alil, I have recruited another unit of horse boys, and I'm going to have him begin to march on uh, Kells. So they're recruiting a small bit, and then we'll have them march to uh, to join up with Flanchina's forces. So a rather interesting development by the Vikings. I don't think there's a whole lot to stop them from marching on Ferns, the capital of Line. I'm not going to lie, that was a, an interesting development, I wasn't expecting that. We will end the winter of 878. We get news that our mother, Land, has died. So, if I'm correct, she was actually married to Aethin Leah, so she was married, obviously, to our father. Well, Shocknell, but on his death, she married uh, Aethin Leah. And... Some Vikings have appeared somewhere. So, Brefni has moved down, or I should say Brefni. Um, Bray has moved down to Skerries. So, yeah, from where we are... Uh, raids minus one. Raids are actually harming our legitimacy. From where we are, we're going to try and march on... Uh, so we've no stance, and we're going to march on Loch Gower. And yeah, we'll just occupy the settlement. Might as well. As for Alil, instead of bringing him across to Kells, we'll bring him down to Clonard. And have him replenish some forces there. As you can see, we now have a chunk. We could recruit up to... Uh, three extra units, but in two turns we're going to have this place, which will knock off 30 food production. So we do actually need to kind of watch our food production. It's in a bit of a... It's in a bit of a precarious position at the moment. To assist with it, uh, Clon McNoise, I'm actually going to go and start building a cattle herd. We're being told that there's low public order in Bray. And that we have skills available for Erman. So, he is our commander. Governance is important. So, a scribe would give him increased governance and a income. A forger, if I'm correct, will increase food production in the local province. So, it's gone from 31 to 36. And I think that's entirely what we might go for. Now, our issue at the moment is that we are not going to be in a position to siege Dublin, especially not if a 14-strong army moves north from Leinster, so I have no idea what's actually going on down there. I'm not too sure if we'd be in a position with Br uh, Bray. I was going to say Brefni. I think we can just click on them here. Two... Request their vassalization. They would find that insulting. So sometimes they become weak enough early on in the game that you can actually vassalize them. And I think for now we're pretty much going to call an end to the year and uh, or an end to the uh, the season. So it hasn't been the most exciting in terms of battles because I was expecting a big battle against the Vikings, but they ran. They're scared. 
Well, the absolute devils, they have taken in Vermoor, and if they were to take Ferns, they would have pushed all the ways down and joined up with Wexford, and they wouldn't be too far from Waterford, the, the Viking settlements down there. This is a rather interesting turn of events. We're pretty much uh, powerless to do anything. Well, these lads have gone in sieging down the area, so do you know what? We as might as well assist them. We will bring our forces to... I won't say assist in the siege, but to basically just stand here and and um, be ready for an attack. Where is our other general? How far in can he get? We'll bring him... Where will we bring him to? If we look at our legitimacy, that negative that we were getting for the raid is gone. Uh, we could we could have him raid here. There's not a whole heap of money. But uh, what I might do is try and get him from uh, towards Loch Gower And see if we can bring the additional forces across to join up with uh, Flanchina's main army here. Now, of course, the name of the game is Total War. And what would have generally happened at this time period is that you would have just gone in against neighbouring rulers, beat them up, and subjugated them. You wouldn't have started seizing territory from them. But uh, because it's called Total War, we're going to see Total War from everyone else. There is Rothcroken, which is within walking distance of Arda. And there is the forces of Ardvaka are actually moving down into uh, Brefni. I should say the forces of Arguilla are moving to, uh, to seize Kelmour. So we're going to have enemies. We have enemies on our border. Anyone, everyone is a potential enemy. And we haven't even looked at what's going on down here yet. So by sending all of our forces to Dublin and having them just wait there, uh, we are putting ourselves in a bit of a, a precarious position. I'm going to try and take the four units here, join them up with Flanch and his army, and we're then going to have to get Alil uh, out of there and recruiting a brand new army to defend the northern borders. We're one turn away from getting the community of St. Chiron built, and that will allow us to build a Celtic cross. But this is a, an unusual turn of events. I really was not expecting that we would be in a position to begin or to take part in a, a siege of Dublin. And we could entirely, with that happening now, see the forces of uh, Dublin move back north to engage with the combined army of Meath and Bray. I'm going to call it there for this episode with this large siege going on. If you've enjoyed the historical context, uh, please do leave a comment below as to whether you want to hear more or less about the history. And I can do a bit of a tour of the country because there's a lot of sites which are represented. Uh, some areas which are represented like Newgrange and North and the, uh, the Hill of Tara and there are interesting uh, historical sites dotted throughout the country. So there has been a lot of research there, in all fairness, but some of the research is a bit, a bit questionable. But thank you very much for joining me on this episode. Please do leave a like if you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you on the next one, and I hope you bring your leathers and your siege equipment with you.